So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Midlands Branch Pipeline Industries Guild webinar today. I'm delighted that so many people have attended. So thank you very much indeed. I think we're hitting a record number of 120 signed up. Um, so that must have something to do with our presenter, David Parkin from uh, Progressive Energy. Uh, he's the director at Progressive Energy and will be talking us through the High Net Northwest scheme. I'll be handing over to David shortly. We've got a couple of um, options for questions. I'm going to pop the, um, I'm going to write a note now on the Zoom chat function. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please raise them there and we'll keep an eye out for them. And then if there's an appropriate time during, we'll, we'll answer those questions. Alternatively, there'll be some time towards the end. We'll close the formal presentation at about quarter to one as normal. Um, but for those of you that want to stay on and, and, and talk a little bit more, please do. And um, we've got um, a bit of time earmarked just for those informal discussions at the end of this webinar. So I'll hand over to David and let you share your screen. So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you very much to the uh, Pipeline Industries Guild. Um, and as anybody who knows me uh, knows, I'm always delighted to talk about HiNet. I'm particularly delighted to talk about HiNet at the start of 2021 because I think this is going to be a absolutely seminal year, uh, not just in the UK's uh, sort of fight against climate change, but globally as well. And I think, you know, we're clearly at a pivotal point in the energy transition. Um, and I think there's been a lot of focus on COVID over the last year, as, as everyone knows. I think as we move out of COVID this year, I think the fact that the, the US are back in the Paris Agreement, the fact that the UK is hosting COP26 this year, I think we're going to see a real swing of momentum behind large scale, serious decarbonisation. And in the UK, um, as many people know, we have made fabulous progress in decarbonising the electricity sector over the last decade or more. Um, that has gone tremendously well, but there are large sections of the economy um, which still emit a lot of carbon, uh, where we have barely moved the needle in terms of emissions over the last uh, sort of few years. Um, and HiNet is a, is a major industrial energy transformation project, which aims to really tackle those hard to reach sectors of the economy. Um, so we saw a lot of policy movement from government in the space last year. So they weren't just focusing on COVID, they were doing vast amounts to get projects like HiNet up and running. I'll talk about some of those policy initiatives as, as we go. Uh, but this is the year really that a lot of these projects move out of conceptual thinking phases into boots on the ground, metal in the ground, real projects that are up, up and running. So that's the backdrop. Um, I'm gonna talk for probably about half an hour. Very happy to, to take questions after that, as Rachel has said. So. So what is HiNet? Um, so many of you will be familiar with it. We've, we've been talking about HiNet for just over four years. It was conceived um, originally by, by National Grid and Cadent, um, my ex-employer, whom I, I know many of you on this call from there. Um, so I guess I've been involved in HiNet since the early days, um, back sort of back end of 2016. Um, and at its heart, it is a large scale, low carbon hydrogen project. Um, and the aim of the hydrogen is initially to decarbonize industry at scale across the Northwest region, but it is also to provide the infrastructure backbone to more broadly decarbonize the region and do what we call cross-sectoral decarbonization to tackle areas like um, heavy transport, domestic heat and low carbon power generation. So what, what we've got with HiNet is a very, low cost, cost effective and deliverable project. And I'll explain why as we go. Um, and it is there to really transition all the green dots, all the orange dots and the yellow diamond you can see on, on this slide across the Northwest to, to low carbon. And the way we're doing that is, is two ways. So the vast majority of these green dots, these are existing industrial emitters. So manufacturing companies you will all have heard of Vauxhall, Unilever, Jaguar Land Rover, Tata Chemicals, they all consume a lot of natural gas today. Our objective is to produce low carbon hydrogen at a central location and take it out by pipeline to these, uh, these locations where they will transition from natural gas to, to hydrogen. Um, 
for other sources where we have what we call process emissions. So these are emissions of carbon dioxide, which, which come from the, the actual manufacturing process of the product. You can't fuel switch these emissions away. This are things like uh, fertilizer manufacturer, um, fertilizer manufacturing, elements of oil refining, elements of cement manufacture. For those, we'll undertake carbon capture and storage directly from their facilities. And I'll say a little bit more about that. So what does this do? Um, it allows a number of these organizations and companies simply to survive. Um, many of them are under increasing threats of, of carbon pricing. And the challenges they face are that they are manufacturers producing um, uh, high volume, low margin commodity products on the global scale. Um, and they, 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 they operate in a global market. Um, other jurisdictions around the world do not see the same level of carbon pricing as they see in the UK. So jobs and manufacturing is under threat in the UK. If we can offer a route for carbon capture and storage or low carbon manufacturing, that helps preserve that manufacturing base here in the UK. And in doing all of this, we, we kickstart that broader transition to this cross-sectoral hydrogen economy. Uh, and I'll come on and talk about what that means uh, over, over the next uh, few, few slides. So the famous high net chart, which many of you have seen for many years, it, but it is still the original and best. So what we're going to do is we are going to produce low carbon hydrogen at scale at a brown, brownfield manufacturing site, uh, which is currently within the existing boundary fence of the Stanlow refinery. So many of you will know this area. So it's the old Shell refinery uh, between Ellesmere Port and Runcorn uh, in, in Cheshire. Um, so the manufacturing process we will use, um, it's a proprietary technology from our project partner, Johnson Mathy. So UK company, UK technology. And what it does is it takes natural gas as an input product. We can also use what's called refinery off gas, which is a, a waste product stream in the refinery. We can use that as a feedstock. That goes into Johnson Mathy's process um, and out of the other end comes two things. So one is the low carbon hydrogen that we want. The other is a waste stream, which is carbon dioxide. And I'll talk about that in, in a moment. So the hydrogen we produce um, in our manufacturing process, we capture just over 97% of the, the carbon that goes into the process. So we get very low carbon hydrogen. Initially, much of that hydrogen will be consumed on site at Stanlow, refi Stanlow Refinery. But as we build out manufacturing capacity, um, we will build a, a hydrogen network, a hydrogen pipeline across the region. So our project partners Cadent are leading on that. Um, and that pipeline will run in the first instance from Stanlow Refinery, broadly east, um, more or less along the direction of the Manchester Ship Canal up towards Manchester city region. And as it goes, it will pick up a lot of the major power stations and a lot of the major industrial users as we go. It will also pick up the existing offtake. So this is where the gas distribution network in the area Cadent gets their natural gas today from the national transmission system. We'll use those offtake points as blend points to put hydrogen into the local distribution network at up to 20% by volume, because we can do that without needing to change anybody's appliance. And what it gives us is at least a start of a trajectory to, to decarbonizing uh, domestic homes. We'll also take the pipeline up into Liverpool city region. Uh, eventually it will go up to, up to Lancashire, uh, Lancashire, but in the first instance, it will be up to St. Helens and picking up a number of the uh, major industrials uh, in that region. Um, we will also run south. Um, so we're gonna come down to the existing natural gas storage facilities in Cheshire. Um, storage is a really important part of the jigsaw here because when we produce the hydrogen, we are essentially using a chemical engineering process. Um, those sort of processes like to run a fairly flat and steady load profile. What they can't do is they can't switch up and down to follow demand. Now, as many of you who work in the gas industry will know, gas demand is very, very peaky. Um, it's peaky because of what we call daily uh, demand changes, diurnal storage, uh, sorry, diurnal demand. Um, there are big swings in, in domestic demand during the day. And then seasonally, there are big, big changes as well. And when you're using natural gas or hydrogen uh, in future for, for thermal power generation, that has big swings as well, because either the wind blows and you don't need thermal power generation, 
or when the wind doesn't blow, you need a lot of thermal power generation very quickly. So that demand is very peaky as well. So the storage facility acts like a big battery for the system and it allows us to match supply and demand. If we didn't have the storage, we'd need to have about three times as much production value, uh, volume, um, but run it at a much lower load factor, which isn't economically sensible. So the chart down on the bottom left um, shows how we're going to tackle um, the, the industrial emissions. So today, uh, and this is shown in the white bars, there are about 6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emitted from, from industry in the Northwest region. By 2030, we aim to have got that down to under half a million tonnes through the HiNet project. So about 2 million tonnes of that reduction comes from the direct emissions capture from the industrial plants, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the rest comes from low carbon hydrogen production in using that to uh, switch industrials from, uh, from, from uh, natural gas today to, to hydrogen. So uh, just talk about the CO2 side of the project. Um, so this is the orange pipeline. Um, what I tend to do is start from the outside in on this side. So we will be permanently sequestering the carbon in geological storage facilities in Liverpool Bay. They are existing natural gas production sites owned and operated by our offshore partner, ENI. So ENI are the Italian oil and gas company. They currently own and operate those assets and they operate the pipeline which comes ashore in North Wales and runs around the North Wales coast to uh, the Connors Key power station. So those, those gas fields are, are nearing end of life. Uh, they'll cease production in the next few years. And we will repurpose existing reservoirs, existing wells, existing wellhead platforms, pipeline infrastructure and the like. So those facilities offshore, uh, that pipeline all the way back to Connors Quay, so that's where it says uh, jobs and skills there, that they are existing assets, existing infrastructure. And that's one of the reasons why HiNet is a very low cost project because we're largely reusing existing infrastructure. Um, what we then need to do is between Stanlow Refinery and Connors Quay, uh, there's about a 30 kilometer section of new build pipeline. Um, and that's the missing piece of the jigsaw. That's the new asset we need to put in place for, for all of this to work. Um, so for that particular pipeline, we've gone through about a year and a half of, of pre-feed engineering. Um, so lots of routing studies. I think we've looked at 14 different routes. Um, we um, commenced the what's called the development consent order, which is the, the permitting process we need. Um, we started that last summer. Um, as of the last couple of weeks, we have started to secure land access along that entire pipeline route and all the options so that we can start doing our ecology surveys on the ground. Um, so really ramping up in terms of engagement uh, with landowners and stakeholders, turning this into, into a real project. Um, last but not least, as we talked about, there are a number of industrial sites um, which emit carbon dioxide today, which will connect directly to the CO2 network, uh, and they're along the pipeline route, uh, and they're a very major part of the system as well. So that, that is HiNet uh, as an overview. I'll, I'll do, uh, I will look at a few more of the details as we go, as we go through the presentation. So many of you will be aware, and this sort of comes back to the, the policy announcement I talked about at the, in, in my introduction, that uh, there was a lot of policy movement towards the back end of last year. So to name but a few, uh, the Committee on Climate Change issued their sixth carbon budget, um, which said, you know, we, we need projects like HiNet. Um, we call them cluster projects. Uh, there are five of those um, sort of in development, six in development around the UK. At least five of those need to be operational by 2030 if we're going to get anywhere near to the net zero trajectory. Um, so clearly high net is, is one of those. Um, the 10 point plan, which was issued by, by Boris Johnson in November, um, set a trajectory towards some of those um, harder to reach sectors of the economy. Um, and it really talks about hydrogen for the first time at a sort of national policy level. Um, it called for um, five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen production by 2030 across the UK. HiNet intends to be producing 3.85 gigawatts by that point. So HiNet can meet somewhere between 75 and 80% of the national target. So we're not aiming small, we recognize we're ambitious, but that's absolutely our, our plan. Um, the 10 point plan also called for carbon capture at up to 10 million tons per year by 2030. 
Um, we're building our capacity um, to be 10 million tonnes by 2030. We plan to be capturing somewhere between seven and eight million tonnes per year by then. So again, we're hitting somewhere between 70 and 80% um, of, of the national target in delivering high net. So I think sometimes people think of high net as a demonstration project, a pilot project, a trial of some sort. It absolutely isn't. This is large scale industrial infrastructure. So think of it more like a HS2. It's not quite as big as HS2, but it's, it's big infrastructure. Um, so, and it, it, is, it is material, not just at a regional scale, but a national scale as well. And the UK government is absolutely committed to, to hydrogen. So I, I have the privilege of sitting on the Ministerial Hydrogen Advisory Council, which was formed last summer by, by the Minister Kwasi Kwarteng. And you know, the, the level of momentum and government support there is now for hydrogen is just astonishing. Um, and I think that's, that's been building over the last few years. So clearly you go back four or five years and seminal projects like Northern Gas Networks H21, many of you will be familiar with that. Uh, high net following fairly shortly thereafter and a steady succession of other hydrogen projects have all paved the way um, for, for this sort of large momentum swing behind hydrogen. And it's probably worthwhile just sort of dwelling for, for a few moments on why hydrogen? Why, why is there so much hype about it? Why, why, do, why do people get so excited about it? Well, the way I characterize it is the UK, as I said in my introduction, has done phenomenally well at decarbonizing electricity. Um, probably one of the leading countries in the world. And we've done that by largely, co uh, largely shutting down coal-fired generation. Um, we've built a vast amount of offshore wind, solar, and our electricity sector is very, very low carbon or increasingly low carbon. But electricity is, is less than a third of our total energy supply in aggregate. And we've seen very little decarbonization of gaseous fuels and liquid fuels, which make up the other two thirds of, of the energy mix in the UK. And the other point, which is critical, it's not just about the aggregate level of, of energy demand and where that comes from. It's also about the flexibility of the, of the energy system as a whole. And nearly all of the flexibility in the energy system on both the demand side and the supply side is provided today by fossil fuels. Um, because fossil fuels give you two things. Well, it's one thing really, but you look at it in two different lenses. They give you dispatchability. So you can basically turn them on when you want them. And fossil fuels are storable. And that's, that's very difficult to do with electricity. And it's very difficult to do with renewable electricity in particular. So we're currently in sort of a small scale beast from the East two. If you go back to beast from the East one, um, sort of three years ago in 2018, um, in aggregate, the gas network was supplying four times as much energy as electricity network that day. Um, but even more fundamental, um, if you look at total energy demand that day across electricity, gas and um, liquid fuels, Fossil fuels made up somewhere between 92 and 94 percent of total energy demand that day because they give you that flexibility. It gives you the flexibility um, when the wind doesn't blow and you need thermal generation, you need a fossil fuel backup. Um, and when everyone turns their boilers on at the same time, you need fossil fuel because it's got that storability. So the key to our energy system is providing that system flexibility with a low carbon source. And that's what hydrogen gives you. It gives you that storability, dispatchability, flexibility, if, if you will. And I think the UK government has recognised that. I mean, it's got a lot of other benefits as well. Um, if it's used in transport, it's got sort of zero emissions at the tailpipe. It's very good for air quality. Um, so there are a number of broader reasons, but I think fundamentally it, it gives you that system level flexibility. So where are we getting to? Um, so the government has committed to issuing a national hydrogen strategy in quarter one of this year. Um, that is well advanced. Um, as I understand it, it will set out not just uh, production targets, but I think it will also set out um, a lot of the work which is currently being done by the energy networks around how you transition networks, it'll look at the demand side, um, and government are being very bullish about that being one of the leading hydrogen strategies across the world. Um, there are also, uh, there's also going to be a consultation on business models. Um, so what do we mean by that? Um, you don't get hydrogen for free. And hydrogen, if it is made from natural gas, is clearly going to be more expensive than, than natural gas. Um, so if we are expecting industrials to switch to hydrogen instead of natural gas, 
someone needs to pay the difference. And the structure of a support mechanism to provide that is what we mean by business models. That's being heavily worked over the last 12, 18 months, and we expect government to formally consult on that this year. So that will provide essentially the, the business model framework, um, the revenue support mechanism, which will allow investment in, in sort of large scale hydrogen projects. Um, in addition, the government's announced a 240 million pound clean hydrogen fund and a billion pound CCS infrastructure fund, uh, and they will both start becoming available this year. Um, the devolved governments are heavily engaged in this, so the Scottish government and the Welsh government are both actively pursuing hydrogen strategies as well. The Energy White Paper came out in December and that uh, sort of had a strong underpinning of hydrogen in it as well. So, so hydrogen has moved in the last four years from being a very niche specialist subject to being front and centre of the government's plan to, to tackling net zero. So how are we going to produce our low carbon hydrogen for, for high net? So as I've talked about, uh, we're using um, proprietary technology from, from Johnson Matthey. It's their low carbon hydrogen uh, technology. Um, it delivers really efficient hydrogen production with high capture rates. So we've been working with Johnson Matthey on this technology for a couple of years now. Um, we spent about a year doing a pre-feed study. Um, we're now halfway through a government funded seven and a half million pound feed study. So our partners for that are Johnson Matthew, the technology provider, SNC Lavala, the uh, uh, Canadian EPC contractor who, who bought Atkins a couple of years ago. They're doing the, the, the engineering design for the package. SR uh, are our project partners. They own and operate Stanley Refinery. They will be the owner and operator for the hydrogen plant. Uh, and ourselves as Progressive who, who sort of lead the consortium. So the four partners are actively engaged in the feed engineering of that, the planning permissions for that. And when we talk about feed engineering, um, we're doing ground investigation works, we're doing the environmental works, we've got the plot um, plan, we've got the utility tie-ins. You know, this is, this is far beyond conceptual and sort of feasibility study level engineering. So what we're looking to do is um, we will decarbonize a significant proportion of the refinery emissions. So we'll take some of our existing off gas as a feedstock, supplement that with natural gas, we'll decarbonize, and then the low carbon hydrogen will be fed back into the refinery to provide a fuel for, for process heat. Um, our first unit um, is, and I'll do this by, by many measures, but 350 megawatts, um, so three terawatt hours a year. Um, so I think in the UK at the moment, there's around four terawatt hours of biomethane plants connected to the natural gas distribution network, and that's about 80 to 100 plants. So in our first plant, we're producing almost as much as all of the UK's biomethane plants in terms of low carbon gas. Uh, it's about 100,000 cubic meters an hour. Um, so again, for any of you who've worked in the, in the biomethane world, a thousand cubic meters an hour to sort of 12, 1500 is a big biomethane plant and we're running at about a hundred times that. So this is a major piece of, of process equipment uh, and it's around nine tons an hour if you, if you work in that measure. So in terms of delivering that, uh, as I say, we've been working on that for a little while and Progressive Energy um, and SR were, were delighted. Um, just a couple of weeks ago to announce the formation of a new company, uh, a joint venture. Um, we haven't named it yet, um, so we're working on that, but we, we have announced a joint venture which will become the delivery vehicle for that hydrogen production facility. Um, so the commitment there is for SR and Progressive Energy to, to work together to, to build the first two plants. So the first plant is three terawatt hours, the next plant is a further six, giving us nine terawatt hours a year in total. Um, that's a 750, mount, 750 million pound capital investment. Um, we got really, really good coverage uh, right around the world, um, Indian company and the UK project development company working together to sort of really create what will be uh, the UK's largest um, hydrogen project by a substantial margin. Um, we're well on the way to, to achieving that. And we're looking to deliver a final investment decision on the, on the first hydrogen plant towards the end of 2022, possibly into 2023, depending on where the CCS network is at, at that point. So um, just last couple of slides, just to wrap up really. Um, so we've talked about a number of these elements of, of, of high net uh, and where are we with all of them? 
So the hydrogen production plant feed for the first plant is underway. The business models are on development. The, the commercial structure with SR is, is underway. Uh, the CO2 transport and storage, um, our project partners ENI have secured their storage license uh, from the Oil and Gas Authority, which is a major sort of regulatory hurdle to overcome. ENI are in the process uh, of becoming fully accountable for the whole transport and storage element from the capture plant boundary onwards, which is which is great. Uh, carbon capture, we have um, progressed well through through pre-feed. Um, the hydrogen network, um, so Caden are leading on that. Um, they have taken that through a pre-feed. They've also secured um, support from Ofgem in the GD2 determination to uh, allow funding for that, that network uh, to be developed into feed, which will commence later this year. Hydrogen storage is being developed by our project partners, Innovin, part of the INEOS group. Um, they already own and operate a number of gas storage facilities in that region. Um, and so as a consortium, um, we're currently in the application process and assessment process for, for securing uh, 30 million pound of government funding, which will be coupled with at least as much match funding from our partners um, to deliver a, a 70 million pound consenting and engineering feed package for everything in that red box. So we're awaiting the outcome of that. Uh, we remain very confident that that will land um, and then that will allow us to sort of commence the, the next phase of the project uh, once that's up and running. The other point just to mention briefly, um, we are undertaking some industrial fuel switching trials. So this is separately funded by, by Bayes. We call these the high net industrial fuel switching project for, for obvious reasons. Um, so what we'll be doing later this year is we will be combusting 100% hydrogen in a large scale industrial boiler at Unilever at their Port, Port Sunlight plant. Um, we will also be burning 100% hydrogen in Pilkington Glasses um, St. Helens facility. Um, and as part of a sort of demonstration process, we have over Christmas been uh, burning 100% hydrogen in a smaller scale industrial boiler at a place called Dumphy in Rochdale in the Northwest. Um, they're a burner manufacturer and test house. So that's been the start of the, the process. So as well as developing and constructing the infrastructure, we are undertaking the underpinning technology demonstration trials as, as well. So the whole sort of ecosystem uh, and infrastructure development is all taking place in, in parallel. So uh, what, what does HiNet give us? Um, it will be operational by 2025. Um, so there's a lot of things we need to get done by then. We're confident we can do them, but the government, the government's stated policy is to have two low carbon clusters up and running by 2025 uh, and a further two by 2030. We're absolutely adamant that HiNet needs to be one of those first two projects uh, for a lot of very good reasons. A lot of our infrastructure is already there. A lot of our partners need the project to happen quickly um, and we've got everything lined up to, to deliver that. Uh, we're low cost for a lot of the reasons I set out. Um, some of the carbon dioxide we're going to capture, particularly from the fertilizer plant, is the lowest cost capture opportunity in the country because essentially it's already captured as part of their manufacturing process. Um, we're low risk, particularly in terms of offshore storage. Uh, ENI, uh, our offshore partners, have known and operated and understand these, these reservoirs and wells really, really well. So we have a very low risk storage project, and because a lot of our infrastructure is there, a lot of the consenting risk uh, is also fairly low as well. So we, we present really a, a low cost, low risk on ramp, if you will, to, to CCS and large scale infrastructure uh, rollouts in the UK. Um, there is a, a big economic benefit to the region in delivering high net. So part of that is through construction jobs. Part of it is about ensuring the retention of existing manufacturing jobs which are absolutely under threat from, from growing carbon pricing, as I talked about in my introduction. Um, so there's a large element of, of this, which is short-term construction jobs, but also long-term operational jobs, and also uh, job retention in what are very high value adding uh, sectors. Um, we've got a great consortium. In fact, we've got two great consortiums. I've named a number of the partners as we've gone. So we've got a hydrogen production consortium, um, we've got a carbon capture and storage and, and hydrogen distribution and hydrogen storage consortium. Um, they are some of the leading companies in the world, certainly some of the leading companies in the Northwest. So ENI are headquartered in Milan, fully committed at a board level to delivering HiNet. Uh, CF Fertilizers headquartered in Chicago. Likewise, they've got a net zero commitment by 2050. They see projects like HiNet as fundamental to that. 
Uh, we're partnered with SR, headquartered in Mumbai in India. They see this as the, the biggest strategic project they have in their portfolio. So at a board level, all of these partner companies are stepping up and committing to delivering high net. But we can't do this by ourselves. Um, we, we do need from government a revenue support mechanism. You do not get net zero for free. Um, at the moment, it is cheaper for all companies to continue to emit carbon dioxide to atmosphere than it is to capture it and store it. Um, and so a government support mechanism to close that gap between the cost of uh, uh, capture and storage and the cost of emitting is, is important. Um, we do need ongoing financial support to get us to final investment decision at the moment. It's very difficult to get third party finance into projects like this. And the reason being is that there's still that uncertainty around the business models and how do people earn a return. And then last but not least, um, there's a lot of complexity to this in terms of the, the regulatory structure in particular and the commercial frameworks. So um, you know, we, we are all assuming that the hydrogen network will be a regulated asset regulated by Ofgem in the same way that gas networks are today. That's not been decided yet. The, the CO2 transport and storage network, again, we assume that that will be a regulated asset. Regulated by whom? We don't know. But as we're very much getting into detailed engineering work, uh, making decisions on, I mean, I was in a call this morning, just as an example, um, we're setting metering standards for the transport and storage network. But at the moment, we don't have a regulator. So there's no regulator to set the metering standards. So we're having to make assumptions and hope that things like that work. But you put all those things together, um, we are hugely, hugely bullish about delivering high net. And as I said in my introduction, I've, I've been involved in the project in a leadership capacity for, for over four years. Um, never has it had as much momentum political support, um, partner engagement as it has today. So over the next, well, particularly over this year as we get mobilized, uh, but over the next few years as we get to FID, it's gonna be a hugely exciting project. I think it will become a lot more visible um, to partner companies, it will become a lot more visible to, to local stakeholders. Um, and we're hugely excited about it. So hopefully I shared some of that with you today and I'm gonna pause there to, to answer any questions you may have. So thank you. David, thank you so much for that presentation. It's such a um, fascinating project and um, great, great that we're leading the way uh, in the Northwest and, and more importantly in the UK. Um, the first question is from Phil Clisham. He said, it's great to see the government beginning to get behind the hydrogen strategy, but 240 million pounds is still a drop in the ocean compared to other government commitments. Given that the case for hydrogen is so strong, why is the government backing so small? Yeah, ab ab absolutely, a, a real bugbear of mine. I mean, yes, um, so on the same day that governments that sort have of announced 240 million for hydrogen and everyone goes, well, hey, isn't that great? They announced 27 billion for road widening or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's a massive frustration, but um, the, the way you need to look at this is, you know, government does not pay for offshore wind, the private sector pays for offshore wind. Uh, in the same way, uh, the private sector will, will provide the capital for nearly all of this infrastructure development. Essentially, what that 240 million is there to do is, is to pump prime and fund some of the development activity ahead of the business models being in place. But as soon as the business models are there, um, and what we're developing is what's called the contract for different structure, which is the same mechanism as, as is used in offshore wind. Once that mechanism is in place, investors, so banks, developers, etc., they recognize that commercial structure and they will invest on the back of it. So, yes, I mean, when it was about a year and a half ago, government first sort of said, oh, we're going to put 100 million pounds into uh, low carbon hydrogen. What, what will it buy us? And we said, well, not very much. It'll buy you 40% of our first plant and no one's going to put in the other 60% until you put a revenue support mechanism in place. So look, we, 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 we do think the 240 million is really important. Um, it, it will really help over the next year or two ahead of final investment decision. And actually it will help mitigate some of the risk for the first two plants when we get to the private sector capital in as well. But fundamentally, this will be private sector capital, which uh, delivers this eventually. Mm, thank you for that. Uh, question from Jan. Will the uh, carbon and the hydrogen pipeline be run in gas phase or liquid phase at high pressure? And how much does it cost to convert the gas to hydrogen using your high net technology? Well, this is one of my favourite subjects. I could spend all afternoon on, on flow assurance and sort of phase envelopes of carbon dioxide and hydrogen, but I don't think anyone would thank me for it. Um, 
so hydrogen, um, that's probably an easier one. Uh, that will be gas phase. Um, it will be in the pipeline we're developing at the moment up to around 50 bar, it'll probably be just under 50 bar. Um, so essentially the, the pipeline which, which came developing is the equivalent of a local transmission system, uh, around 80 kilometers, probably 24 inch in diameter for the main trunk, uh, up to about 50 bar. CO2 is harder. Um, so initially when we've got relatively low mass flow rates and we've got a low reservoir pressure, which we're injecting into, we'll run the system in gas phase. As mass flow rates increase, um, you get higher pressure losses through the pipeline. Um, you, and over time as well, the, the pressure in your reservoirs grows. So at some point in product life, we will transition from gas phase to dense phase for CO2, but we will only transition at the beachhead. So the onshore section will be gas phase throughout the project life cycle. Um, We've done that because it's it's easier to consent a gas phase pipeline than it is a dense phase pipeline, uh, particularly as we have to thread our pipeline through some through some urban areas. So consenting a, a 35 bar pipeline is, is easier than consenting a 135 bar pipeline in, in our view. Um, the, the extra sort of consideration and excitement if you if you're into sort of phase envelopes of CO2 with impurities is there is a potential opportunity for the project to run offshore for a for a period in in two phase um that is very innovative it hasn't been done before it's not our baseline case um so our baseline case is we operate in gas phase for a period and then we switch to to liquid phase uh, sorry dense phase um if we can get the modeling to work if we can get ourselves comfortable we may run in two phase for a period of time because it does give us a bit more um, efficiency um for, for the system so hopefully that answers that one um, how much energy does it cost to convert the gas to hydrogen um, using low carbon hydrogen technology? So the, the process, um, now if I get this right, I think thermal efficiency is about 85%. So I think it's 420 megawatts of natural gas in for 350 megawatts of, of hydrogen out. Um, I would refer you to our pre-feed report, which is on the Bayes Hydrogen Supply Project website. Uh, that sets out all of the sort of the key thermal efficiency and sort of capture rate parameters which we're operating to. Uh, and it's a really good report, actually, 100 or so pages um, and, and is excellent as an introduction. Great, thank you. Um, can you use exist, existing gas pipelines to transport hydrogen? Wow, we're getting all of the million dollar questions here today, aren't we? Um, yes, uh, yes and no, uh, no and yes. Um, so um, pipeline is quite a broad term. So um, if you start at the, the, the bottom of the hierarchy, so um, at a very sort of local distribution level, there is a lot of work going on. Um, so uh, the ENA, Energy Networks Association, on behalf of the gas distribution networks are running a, a broad program called Gas Goes Green. Within that, there are a number of work streams looking at uh, proving the safety case, proving the technology for conversion of distribution networks um, from natural gas to, to hydrogen. Um, there are various parameters to consider, sort of leakage rates um, uh, 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 and the like. Um, I think at a broad brush level, I think if you've got a largely plastic network, um, then yes, I think if you've got existing sort of bits of cast iron in there or, or other materials, it's gonna be harder to make the case. Um, but there is a lot of safety work going on to look at that and all the different material configurations. Um, so it's probably well worthwhile touching base with the, the Gas Goes Green uh, project. If we then move a bit further up, uh, further up the hierarchy um, and look at local transmission and, um, and the NTS national transmission system, uh, I think for a long time there was generally a sense that no, you can't. Uh, I think increasingly now national grids as the transmission operator in the UK are becoming increasingly confident about being able to um, move large sections of their pipeline network, potentially not all, to, to hydrogen. Um, there is a, uh, an active group across all the transmission operators across Europe who've been doing a lot of research on transmission grade assets. And I think the general view is that most will be repurposable to, to hydrogen. I think the areas where we've got difficulty are on some of the um, sort of components along the system. So whether it's valves, valve seatings, compressors uh, and the like, uh, but the actual raw pipeline there's a pretty good likelihood that we will be able to do that. Um, but you know, to reiterate for, for HiNet, um, we are going for a new build uh, local transmission system. Um, we think that's sort of the, the best way forwards because certainly for a period of time, just for resilience purposes, you can't turn everyone off natural gas. 
turn them on to hydrogen and say, yeah, we guarantee you 99.99% uh, sort of uh, flow when we've only got one hydrogen plant and one hydrogen pipeline. So for a period of time, there will be parallel supply from natural gas and hydrogen. So hence why we've got a new, uh, uh, a, a new hydrogen pipeline. Thank you. Um, how will the hydrogen be stored? The image, the one on your, I think it was your second slide, showed a boulder slash rock. Will the storage be geological? Um, yeah, so hydrogen storage onshore uh, will be in salt cavern storage. Um, so that's uh, a well accepted understood technology for natural gas today. Um, there is actually hydrogen stored in salt cavern stores in Teesside. Um, so there is some further work which needs to be done um, to, to assess it. But I think there's a, there's a very good sense, certainly in the academic literature and what's been done before, that that will be perfectly feasible. Um, so we see that as one of the, the lower, lower risk elements of the project, uh, to be honest. Um, I think as we continue to build hydrogen storage, uh, sort of in the hydrogen economy across the UK, we will need to consider um, seasonal storage in bigger geological stores offshore. Um, so whilst the onshore storage will give us sort of daily storage, um, I think the, uh, the, the bigger seasonal stuff. So many people on the call will be familiar with um, large scale natural gas storage offshore in the rough uh, gas storage field uh, in the Southern North Sea. We probably need something similar to that for, for large scale hydrogen storage uh, further downstream. Thank you. Um, Back to uh, that same slide again, where it have got skills and people. Do you think the utilising existing oil and gas skill sets will be a key part of this scheme? Yeah, hugely. So um, ENI currently employs several hundred um, operators for their, uh, for their natural gas fields offshore. A, a large number of those skills will be you know, directly applicable to CCS. So we're doing offshore maintenance, we're doing reservoir engineering, we're doing metering, we're doing pipeline inspection, we're doing integrity management. Um, a lot of those skill sets are exactly the same. Um, so yes, um, you know, I think that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think if anything, um, we, we have some concerns around construction skill availability because we're one of four or five projects which is looking to develop at the same time. They'll all be looking to put in more pipeline than has been seen built in the UK for a long period of time. Um, so to say, we, we want to do 30 kilometers of CO2 pipeline over one construction season, um, 80 kilometers of hydrogen pipeline over two or three construction seasons, um, at the same time as Humberside and Teesside and Acorn up in Scotland are all looking to develop projects as well. So, you know, just making sure that the right skill sets are in place to do that construction is, is important. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and get through the next four questions so, so that people get the answers that they're looking for. Um, Stefan, for the 20% hydrogen replacement in residential natural gas usage, how much more energy is required and is this producing more carbon that is then stored compared to keeping 100% natural gas usage by homes? Um, so. If we produce the hydrogen through the thermal through, through the process which I've just talked about, um, yes, we are utilizing some more energy to produce it, but we're capturing all of the carbon dioxide. So essentially the carbon dioxide emitted at the point of use will be lower than it otherwise would have been. Um, now 20% by volume is only six and a half percent by energy. So essentially, um, uh, and it's just bear with me, um, we capture 97% of the carbon. Um, there are other upstream emissions, which means we're probably somewhere 90% plus uh, more carbon efficient than, than using natural gas directly. Um, if we assume that's 100%, then on a like for like efficiency, we will be um, essentially reducing emissions from domestic properties by 6.5% by using a 20% volume. In reality, it'll probably be slightly closer to 6%. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Um... Question from Nikki. iGEM are currently working on updating standards to reflect hydrogen usage based on all that research that is being done and data coming out. I that was just in, in relation to what David had said before in, in relation to somebody else's question. There, are, there is work being done to allow for, for that to, to happen, the changes in the, uh, the network usage. There is. I saw, I saw a uh, revised TD1 floating around very recently. So, so good work by everybody involved in that. Okay, final two. Um, in case of existing pipeline usage, will there be any issues of leakage at any joining points such as flanges? Um, 
so I probably won't go into sort of detail in terms of, sort of hydrogen sort of use in existing pipelines. Um, there are a wide range of factors which go into a quantitative risk assessment. Um, you know, looking at uh, ability to odorize, looking at material degradation, looking at sort of increased sort of um, uh, propensity to, to leak through flanges. So uh, yes, all of those need to be assessed in the round as part of a wider, what we call a QRA, which looks at all the potential risks. Um, so yes, is a short answer to, to the question. Um, and last one, what's the ongoing legacy cost of the permanently sequestered carbon? I don't know how to answer that. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I guess it probably means, uh, it probably, it's probably a question of what is meant by, by legacy cost. I guess this might not particularly answer the question, but you know, the, the objective is to permanently sequester. Um, so yes, there will be some ongoing sort of uh, what we call MMV, monitoring, uh, measurement and verification to ensure that it doesn't leak. So um, we, we will monitor sort of injection into the well, into the reservoir through the operational life. And then after the end of the project, we will continue to monitor to ensure that it doesn't leak for a, for a period of time. Um, if we can demonstrate, which we certainly hope we can, because we've got good confidence in the reservoir that it doesn't leak, there, there shouldn't be any sort of further legacy cost beyond that sort of uh, monitoring. Um, so I would, I would hope that that answers the question. Um, Rachel, there's just one other question sort of earlier on, which I think you might have missed, which I think was quite important. Um, which was about cost of hydrogen. So I might just answer that one. If oh, I'm the honest. cost per cubic meter. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do it by megawatt hour. Um, so the cost of hydrogen production is forty-three pounds per megawatt hour, uh, based on a twenty pound per megawatt hour natural gas feedstock cost coming in. So um, essentially, what you have is your natural gas comes in. You pay twenty pounds a megawatt hour for that. Your other £23 is made up of paying off the capital cost of your plant, paying the OPEX of the plant, so the energy use, and paying for transport and storage of the CO2. That adds up to about £23 a megawatt hour. So what we need in place is essentially a subsidy mechanism. Sorry, I shouldn't use the word subsidy. A revenue support mechanism, which closes the gap between the £43 and the £20, which allows the hydrogen production plant to sell hydrogen at broadly the same price as natural gas. Because if you're an industrial consumer, you're not gonna go and buy hydrogen at 40 pounds a megawatt hour. Even with the best will in the world, if your energy costs double, you're just not going to do it. And government recognise that. So the proposed support regime essentially subsidises the producer to be able to sell the hydrogen at the same price or potentially at a slight discount to natural gas to provide an incentive to switch to low carbon. Um, and again, the, the numbers for that and the methodology for the pricing, uh, et cetera, is all set out in the uh, report I referred to earlier on the Bayes website for hydrogen supply. Excellent, thank you very much. I think that's all the, all the presentations. Oh no, hang on, there is another one actually in between the thank yous. Will the hydrogen pipeline be covered under the Gas Act or will the UK government produce new legislation? Yes, uh, again, really good question. So the working assumption from everyone involved, um, I don't, know whether it's been tested legally is that essentially this will become uh, a regulated asset under Ofgem and that Ofgem have the powers uh, under the Gas Act to, to regulate as such. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm pretty confident that will be the case, um, but I am not a, a regulatory lawyer by any stretch of the imagination, so uh, someone brighter than I might need to uh, examine that in more detail. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's the end of the of the formal question and answer session. So um, I want to say massive thank you very much, David, from the Pipeline Industries Guild for your presentation. Um, it's attracted lots of uh, questions and interest and people dialing in. And that's what's really important, bringing everybody together to talk about these um, common challenges that are facing everybody. I, I don't think anybody's avoiding the carbon topic in any industry at, at the minute. So um, really on topic. Um, I'm going to close out the presentation now, but for anybody who would like to stay on the line, we will we will stay on for another 10 minutes or so. Um, you can take yourself off mute and uh, turn the, your video on if you want to, just so we can have a bit more interaction. I know there's more questions rolling in as I'm talking. So um, we'll just let HQ stop the recording and just give it, those that want to dial out a, a second to dial out and then we can, can carry on the discussion. <laughs>